So I have now the pleasure to present Thank you so much. the last um, lecture, uh, which concerns historic mortar study, design and use of compatible restoration mortars at the Holy Edicule Rehabilitation. Uh, this is for us not the first time to do this. Uh, we started from Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. Uh, a, a team from the broader research team, uh, which is uh, uh, responsible for this lecture, uh, comprised of uh, Dr. Maria Apostolopoulou, Dr. Eleni Angelakopoulou, uh, Associate Professor Asterios Bacolas, uh, and me. Uh, is a part of the larger team, uh, and part of it, Dr. Uh, Mary Apostolopoulou, uh, is the one charged with the burden to present all historic and repair mortars in one hour. Mary, you are having the floor. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Is the microphone working? Yes, yes. Yes, Mary. Okay, today we will be discussing a historic mortar study and the design and use of compatible restoration mortars at the Holy Edicule Rehabilitation. Uh, as you probably all know, mortars are complex composite materials. Uh, to fix a mortar, we need a binder. We need aggregates. Uh, in many cases, additives are used to, for better quality and for better characteristics. Uh, these are all mixed with water. And after hardening, we have a mortar. Μέρι, δεν ακούγε τη φωνή σου. Α, εντάξει, okay. Τώρα ακούγεται. Μέρι, δεν σε ακούμε. Ε, όχι. Ε, ακούγε, ακούγε, ακούγε. Πρέπει να το μικρόφωνο. Όχι, Μέρι, καλά ακούγεσαι. Όχι, μια χαρά ακούγεται. Οκ, so I'll try and speak a little bit louder then. A little bit slower, Μέρι. Oh, it's lower now. Οκ, now can you hear me? Is there a problem with the... It is worse now, Mary. I don't it know why. Worse. What did you do? What, whatever I you do... Meant slower, doing... not... Uh, I mean... Uh... The beginning was better. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Did Low. I do something? No. How about now? <laughs> better. Keep okay, talking. so uh, if you can hear me, I'll continue. Can you? Yes, yes, please. Yes, please. please. Okay. Uh, so, uh, after centuries or even millennia of service, uh, you, we all understand that historical mortars are disturbed systems. This means that they do not have the characteristics that they had in the beginning when they were Mary, first applied. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, wait one second. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, the raw materials which were used for the production of mortars uh, were selected, obviously, uh, on account of av available queries, whatever was nearby. Sometimes, if it was a very important monument, they could bring raw materials from another area, so we had transportation. Uh, of course, available technology. This, this means that uh, each mortar's technology has to do with the advances of the era and the technical expertise of the workers. The use of the mortar in the structure, this means that a floor mortar would have a different characteristics than, let's say, a joint mortar. Uh, economic factors always played a role in this. This depended on how expensive the materials would be. The kiln potentials, this means how high the temperatures could go to produce the raw materials, and also different symbolisms. Uh, the most important thing when designing a restoration mortar is uh, compatibility, because throughout the last decades, we've seen many problems in monuments due to incompatibility issues, uh, very serious issues. So a compatible restoration mortar, we could define it as one that does not negatively affect historical building materials. In order to be able to design a compatible restoration material, we have to do three things. The first thing is characterization of historical mortars. It is very important to characterize the historical mortars in order to design a restoration one. 
uh, and also during this process, we can also do a study on the decay of the historical mortar. This is important because uh, we can design a mortar that is resilient and does not have the problems the historical mortar had. Another issue we must uh, see is the study of other building elements. Uh, because the mortar is never in a masonry on its own. It is always joining different building elements, either stones or bricks. So it is important to also see this. Uh, the third thing that we should look at is examine environmental factors. Because, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear. Okay. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, environmental factors are important because, as we said before, we do not want to use a restoration mortar that could create a problem. And also, we want it to be resilient in the environment of the monument. Uh, compatibility is a very, very complicated issue because it is based on characteristics. Uh, when we discuss the compatibility of a restoration mortar, it is not only mechanical properties, let's say, because many people only look at that. Um, it's microstructure, which affects hygric properties. We do not want accumulation of, let's say, humidity in the historic materials. Uh, we must have chemical compatibility. We do not want it to chemically attack the historic mortar or be attacked by the historic mortar. A dimensional compatibility, that is, for an example, if we have very high shrinkage, we could have micro movements and create a problem for the structure. And also historical aesthetical. That means that we don't want it to be obvious that it is a restoration mortar, but however, a small difference is desirable because we also want to keep the historical truth. Apart from compatibility, another very important aspect of restoration mortars is performance. Uh, when we speak about performance of a restoration mortar, what we mean is enhancement of, its, of the structure's response under, under loads. Uh, this means that we do not just copy a historic mortar and fix a new one with exactly the same characteristics. Our goal is to reinforce the structure as well so that it can uh, respond well under static and dynamic loads. Of course, performance must always be accompanied need by incompatibility. If we have a performing mortar, which is very good for the mechanical behavior of a structure, but compatibility is not ensured, in the long run, all the building materials of the structure will be negatively affected. And that means that in the long run, we will have a very serious problem. So sustainability will not be achieved. Uh, in our laboratory, we have a design methodology for restoration mortars. It is a holistic and interdisciplinary because we need all aspects of the monument, because as we said, compatibility is a very difficult issue. Uh, the first step is diagnosis. We document and study the historical structure and the material data. Uh, this includes historical mortars, main historical building elements, the specific environment of the structure, we have to do a vulnerability assessment of the structure. This is done by civil engineers. Um, this is important because we have to see if, if it can withstand loads and we have to see the performance of the mortar through this. And also another very important issue is geometrical and architectural characteristics. All these stages can give us some criteria which the restoration mortars must comply with in order to be compatible and performing. Um, of course, this is not something new. This is something that's been studied for decades. So luckily we have many tools and methodologies at our disposal. Uh, in, this, in the diagnosis stage, we have um, a methodology for the characterization of historical mortars and the diagnosis of their decay. This means that we know which uh, measurements should be conducted and different measurements can give us different characteristics regarding the historic mortar. Um, mineralogical composition, microstructural characteristics, mechanical strength. This is very important because this analysis can give us an indication on the production technology and the raw materials used for the production of the historic mortars. And um, the physical, chemical, and mechanical characteristics of the historical mortars are the basis for the design of compatible and performing restoration mortars. Therefore, the historical mortar is the basis, of course, of any design methodology. 
A historic mortars characterization is also a very complicated issue. It's like a puzzle. Uh, we do many different measurements, and each technique gives us a different aspect of the historical mortar. All these aspects together, like a puzzle, when put together, can define a historic mortar. Uh, also, um, a lot of study has been conducted, especially from our laboratory at NTUA, and this has given us uh, the, the opportunity to be able to categorize historical mortars according to their characteristics. Uh, let's say in this table above, you can see the different ranges of values based on thermal analysis results. And according to uh, the results of the historic mortar one is studying, it can be categorized into lime mortar, lime with an altered portlandite, hydraulic lime mortars, natural pozzolanic mortars, and artificial pozzolanic mortars, which includes also crust brick. Uh, we also have done the same um, work uh, based on mercury intrusion per symmetry results. That means microstructural characteristics. So according to the microstructural characteristics, which we um, uh, measure on a historic mortar, we can also categorize it into a specific uh, type of mortar. Now, uh, how can the diagnosis results act as input for the design and selection of a restoration mortar? This is the important question. Um, of course, at our methodology, a monument is the basis of everything. Each monument is uh, unique and has unique needs and unique materials, especially after centuries. Uh, this means that, uh, as we said before, we have a range of characteristics which are interdisciplinary, which will affect our decision making. Uh, so, at this point, we will see the definition of compatibility and performance criteria, which is helps us design. And all this study can help us define limit values, which the restoration mortar must fulfill. Uh, work has been done on this issue as well for decades. Uh, so, we do have some acceptability limits uh, regarding the characteristics that we want restoration mortars to have for different categories, meaning that we know that these are performing and compatible based again on thermal analysis results and mercury intrusion per symmetry. Another issue is uh, the evaluation of the vulnerability and structural integrity of a monument. Uh, this can be done in many different ways. Uh, some use analytical formulas. Uh, sometimes experimental investigations are done where different masonries are constructed and um, different mortars are used to join the building elements and are examined under different loads, either dynamic or static. Uh, it is very common lately to do an investigation through the use of computational simulations. Uh, this involves the analysis of finite element model or fragility analysis. Uh, when a computational simulation is used, we can uh, study the current state of a monument, that means with its historic materials before any restoration, and for different repair scenarios. This is very, very useful because by comparing the current state and different repair scenarios, that means mortars of different mechanical characteristics, we can determine the lower limit value which the restoration mortar must accomplish. That means the compressive strength, the target compressive strength of the restoration mortar. Um, now for the design of restoration mortars, which is the third step, there are again different uh, tools that we use. Uh, the reverse engineering methodology is very important uh, and it has been um, around for a few decades and it has been designed by the laboratory, the NTUA laboratory. Uh, the first stage has to do with characterization of historic mortars. Uh, in the second stage, we design and produce restoration mortars. Uh, we use different raw materials and different synthesis parameters. We might change the mixing. Uh, we might change something during the curing. Uh, we assess the characteristics. According to the assessment of the restoration mortar characteristics, we might have something which is successful and has the desirable characteristics or we might have to go on to a synthesis optimization. So we turn around to the design and production of restoration mortar states, and we might change a few things in order to achieve more enhanced characteristics. And in the end, the last step of the reverse engineering methodology is a pilot application and assessment on the monument.
Uh, restoration mortars are assessed in fresh state. Uh, that means right after the wa after mixing, we combine the raw materials, we add the water, and after the mixing procedure, we see different fresh state characteristics. These are very important because they affect the later characteristics during hardening, but it also has to do with application of the mortar during the application stage. And the, so we assess a mortar during fresh state, and we also assess a restoration mortar during setting and hardening uh, in the long run. Uh, for some mortars, this must, might take up to 18 months. Let's say lime mortars take a very long time to stabilize. So setting and hardening can uh, continue for a long time. Uh, there is also a specific methodology for this. Uh, after mixing, we put the mortar into molds. Uh, we let it set and harden, and then we do different measurements to see the different characteristics we discussed earlier. Chemical characteristics, microstructural characteristics, mechanical, dimension, and hygric. Uh, thus, we can evaluate mortar performance. Now, let's see all this in the case of the Holy Edicule of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Uh, as you probably have already discussed, the Holy Edicule is a very complex structure. It has multiple structural layers, and it even encloses parts of the original carved tomb. Um, as you have already heard, the structural layers around the tomb chamber are, are slightly more complicated because of the presence of the holy rock. You can see it on the left side uh, of the screen. And uh, the Chapel of the Angel is uh, slightly less complicated. Um, as you all know, the Holy Edicule before the project presented intense deviations from verticality and buckling. Uh, this necessitated a study, a diagnostic study, to see the causes for these deformations. Uh, during this stage, uh, the historical mortars were studied, along with other things, and it was assessed that the decay, their decay, was the main cause for these issues. Um, the mortars were found, um, they had undergone swelling and alteration. Uh, this was an account of uh, high humidity within the masonry, which we couldn't see at this point because the marble facings were still around the monument. However, we did see high percentages of soluble salts. Uh, and the historical cause for all this, uh, which contributed to this problem, was probably the precipitation of rainwater because above the dome, the Rotunda Dome, the Oculus was open until 1868. So this means that water, when it rained, precipitated onto the Holy Edicule. At the same time, uh, we had an indication that humidity rose from the underground environment. Of course, this during the project was uh, validated that it was true. Another issue which was um, aggravating this situation of the mortars behind the marble facings was breathability issues. So water was able to uh, enter the masonry, but it could not leave the masonry because the marble facings had been joined by lead ceiling. Between the marble facing members, you can see here in this uh, area, the lead ceiling. This did not allow breathability. Uh, so we underwent uh, characterization of historical mortars. Uh, during the study, we only had a few samples. However, during the project, uh, we were able to select more samples, especially from areas which were um, replaced. Uh, the study of a, a high amount of mortars from the Holy Edicule, 104 historic joint and filling mortars were examined showed that there were many, many, many different categories of historic mortars, as uh, Dr. Delegu said earlier. Um, we found gypsum-based mortars, mis mixed gypsum lime, lime with an altered portlandite, and lime-based mortars. Um, now, the whole point is that uh, this, of course, was in a way expected because the Holy Edicule has a very long history of 1,700 years of being destroyed and reconstructed. This embeds one historical phase into the other. Uh, we underwent a study in order to classify the lime-based mortars. Of course, we knew they were lime-based, but we wanted to see their production technology. Uh, we used the, the tool that we discussed earlier with different ranges of values for categorization. 
uh, using the inverse hydrolysis radio, which is um, uh, measured during thermal analysis. It's the amount of water uh, which is um, bound to hydraulic compounds uh, to the carbon dioxide released from a carbonate material. Uh, this classification showed that even the lime-based mortars, which is only one category of the four we said earlier, uh, are also divided into different types. So we found typical lime mortars, which means without hydraulicity, hydraulic lime mortars, the use of hydraulic lime, uh, lime artificial pozzolan mortars, and lime crust brick mortars. So we see here that already uh, this is a very complicated situation. This isn't a monument which has one historic mortar which you have to use for the design. Um, parallel, in parallel, we see that the unaltered portlandite that we found in the masonry in certain areas indicates conditions which do not favor carbonization of calcium hydroxide. This means that um, the microclimate within the masonry, because the, remember the masonry is behind stone facings, uh, does not uh, favor carbonization. So this had to be taken into account, of course. So in conclusion, the holy edical mortars presented intense differentiations regarding their physical chemical characteristics and were classified into many categories. Uh, we also use the microstructural characteristics of the historic mortars to see how the classification would work, this tool. Uh, the historic mortars were found, of course, in a very bad state of preservation. As we said earlier, we had swelling phenomena and a high amount of uh, soluble salts. So this had negatively affected the microstructure of the historic mortars. But again, we found the same categories as before for the lime mortars. Uh, we conducted sieve analysis. Uh, during sieve analysis, so that is a physical separation of the historic mortar, where you can see the amount of binder to the amount of aggregate. So you can kind of see the design ratios that they used historically. Uh, this was very surprising because we had a very big rains, not only of uh, the size of the aggregates, but also of the binder to aggregate ratio. And also, apart from the very high rains, uh, rains among mortars, we saw that the ratio was very high. The binder was in many cases more than the aggregate. And this is very unusual because usually we have more aggregates per weight than binder. Um, so this also creates a complicated situation. Uh, the total soluble salts measurements, which were conducted on the historic materials after we had all the samples, 104 samples, we saw extremely high specific conductivity values, extremely high, and also a very high rains. And this indicated a highly corrosive environment, which means that the restoration mortar will have to serve well in this highly corrosive environment. Uh, apart from the study of the historic mortars, uh, we also used NDT techniques, as you heard also earlier. Uh, GPR measurements showed a lack of cohesion between layers and the presence of microcracks. Uh, while infrared thermography showed incompatibility between historic mortars and stones and anisotropy of the masonry. Uh, while, as you see at the lower part, it also indicated rising damp from the underground. All this must be taken into account. Of course, um, taking into account that all the mortars were different categories, incompatibility was not completely expected. Um, during the diagnosis, apart from the historical mortars analysis, uh, civil engineers, uh, which were part of the NTUA interdisciplinary team, also um, studied the response of the monument through finite element model analysis. As we said earlier, they studied the current state of the monument, you can see in this image here, and then they tried different restoration scenarios. So uh, the conclusion was that uh, the restoration mortar must have a level of uh, 15 megapascal, uh, megapascal uh, compressive strength in order to ensure the structural stability of the monument. Um, also, we had other issues which were taken into account for the design of the mortars, and this had to do with technical requirements. Each project is unique. 
Sometimes there is a lot of time and the construction site can be simple. In the case of the Holy Edicule, this was not the case. Um, <clears throat> for one, uh, the Holy Edicule had to be remain open for pilgrims and for religious uh, rituals. Uh, so this meant that we wanted early acquisition of mechanical strength because it had to be this had to do with safety issues. And also we had a very tight project time frame. So this meant that the restoration mortars would be applied and three months later, the, the stone facings would have to be reinstalled. So it was very important after seeing that the historical mortars uh, had a problem with carbon mason to select a restoration mortar that presented fast consumption of calcium hydroxide. So taking all of the above into account, um, we were able to uh, define different criteria which the restoration mortar must comply with, and also different criteria that had to do with the design of the restoration mortar. Uh, some criteria were extracted based on the historic mortar study. You can see all the criteria here. Uh, some on the non-destructive testing and its results. And some criteria on the finite element model. This had to do with the acquisition of compressive strength at least 15 uh, megapascal. While the specific demands of the project also demanded extra criteria, additional criteria. So, as we said earlier, some of this criteria was used for the design of the restoration mortars, for the selection of the raw materials and their proportions. Uh, the study indicated that most of the historical mortars were artificial pozole and lime mortars. So, it was decided to put special emphasis on the study of lime artificial pozole and uh, mortars. This means um, brick dust or metakaolin. Um, the fact that the lime gypsum mortars were in a very bad state of preservation indicated to avoid uh, redoing this, uh, reproducing such a mortar. Uh, the aggressive and corrosive environment of the structure indicated the mortars must not introduce soluble salts, therefore the raw materials must be free of soluble salts. Uh, we decided also that uh, the lime-based restoration mortar should have a pozolan uh, because this would ensure compatibility with all mortar types because this was a difficult situation having different categories. Uh, the use of silicious sand was also considered uh, a necessity because silicious sand shows higher resilience in corrosive environments historically. Uh, while the geometry of the structure indicated the use of sand for joint mortars, uh, either zero to two millimeters or zero to four millimeters. So it had a restriction on the size of the sand, the geometry of the joints. Apart from the selection of raw materials, the previous diagnostic study also uh, helped us in the selection of the raw materials proportions. Uh, it was very important to ensure fast consumption of uh, calcium hydroxide this we wanted for two reasons, to avoid sulfacin phenomena because we have gypsum in the structure, but also to achieve early stabilization because as we said, it was important for things to happen fast. Um, we wanted a mortar which presents adequate hydrolicity because as we said, we we're dealing with a monument in high humidity environment. Uh, and we also want high mechanical strength. It was decided to optimize the binder to aggregate ratio because Putting in more binder than aggregate in the historical mortars, uh, history showed that it did not work. And that is part of the reason that the historic mortars were such de so degraded. Uh, and it was also decided that the mortar must have adequate hydrolicity in order to be able to perform in an aggressive environment of high humidity. Uh, so we designed different mortars in order to compare them and see which one has the characteristics that we want based on the above. Uh, we also fixed, um, we also produced two mortars, an aerial lime mortar and the lime putty mortar in order just to have a comparison because we knew that these two would be unacceptable. Um, <clears throat> uh, the rest of the criteria had to do with the assessment of the restoration mortar. So they don't uh, play a role in the design, but they do in the assessment after the production of the mortars and after their setting and hardening.
And uh, these different criteria helped us because they defined an area of acceptable values regarding the restoration mortar characteristics. Uh, so by doing different measurements, thermal analysis, uh, studying the microstructure, studying mechanical properties, uh, studying the shrinkage of the mortar and its hygric behavior, we had criteria enabled to know or in order to know which mortar would be the best and be able to select the best mortar. Uh, here we can see the results of a uh, thermal analysis above and mercury intrusion porosimetry below. Uh, we use the ac acceptability limits, which we discussed above in the tools and methodologies that already exist to see which restoration mortars are have uh, characteristics that are within these acceptable values. Uh, we wanted to also see which mortar has adequate hydrolicity under seven. So only these were acceptable. Um, and then microstructural characteristics, we wanted them to be within the acceptability limits. So some are beyond this, of course. Uh, we studied the consumption of calcium hydroxide. As we said earlier, it is very important for the calcium hydroxide to be consumed early on, uh, as early as possible, in order to avoid sulfase and and also we want fast carbonation because the stone facings would be reinstalled. Uh, so here you can see the different mortars. Of course, the aerial lime and the lime putty mortar, which have no pozolan, are completely inadequate. Even a year later, there is a lot of calcium hydroxide in the mortar. But we do see that the uh, pozolanic mortars have a much better behavior. And especially the lime metacaolin mortar with the most metacaolin, we see that already at 28 days, a very high amount, uh, all of the calcium hydroxide has been consumed. So this was very important for us because at three months, we would have to reinstall the marble facings and we could be sure that the mortar is stable at this point. Um, we said earlier that the mechanical performance of the mortar was especially important for different issues and for the structural stability and for safety issues. Uh, we studied compressive and flexural strength for different times. Uh, we saw that the lime and mortar, of course, has the uh, fastest uh, acquisition of mechanical strength and acquires the highest mechanical strength of all the examined mortars. Uh, so this was something uh, positive for the lime and mortars. Um, of course, because of the humidity that we discussed earlier and the rising damp, uh, we don't want a restoration mortar which aggravates this situation. Uh, so among the compatible uh, values, we want the lowest one, the lowest capillary rise coefficient. Again, the lime and mortars, you can see them here, uh, they have the lowest value but within acceptable values, we can see that it is the same um, uh, magnitude of values with the other mortars. However, it is lower. Uh, this means that it will introduce less humidity into the masonry. Another important issue, as we said before, is that the holy edicule has multiple uh, um, layers. Uh, this means that we want the mortar after it's applied to be as stable as possible uh, regarding its volume. We don't want a high shrinkage. High shrinkage is negative anyway, because when you have intense shrinkage, cracks are formed. But especially when you have multiple structural layers, it is important to have a situation which is as stable as possible. Now, the lowest shrinkage was again presented by the lime metacaoli mortars, as you can see right here. Uh, while the highest shrinkage is uh, by the aerial and lime putty mortar, which of course, was not uh, dictated by the design criteria. We only put it for comparison reasons. Uh, the above assessment seeing different characteristics of the restoration mortar uh, so that the lime metacaolin with the highest metacaolin percentage, um, one uh, gram per one gram, one gram lime, one gram metacaolin, presented uh, the best characteristics according to the criteria that the, the diagnosis states had set. This allowed us to study and select the commercial lime at the mortar, which had no cement, no soluble salts, and very good characteristics. It was also an M15 restoration mortar, which means it had the appropriate compressive strength. Um, the use of a commercial mortar uh, was not only necessitated 
by the above, but it was also very good because we had a tight time frame and a very unique working site. A, a unique working site where we only had a part of the area around there. And we could only isolate part of the area and it was a fully functional religious monument. So this was very helpful for us. After selecting the correct restoration mortar, which was the most compatible and performing, a, the masonry behind the marble facings was cleaned, as you can see here. It was repointed with the restoration mortar, as you can see in here. A, as you discussed earlier, certain parts of the masonry were reconstructed, the lower parts, which had problems with a new stone and the same restoration mortar, of course, as you can see in this area right here. Here's the historical masonry and here's the restored masonry. A grounding was conducted after the repointing of the masonry. And after the marble, after the um, a three months, the marble facings were reinstalled and the joints of the marble facings were repointed with the same restoration mortar. It optimized, we optimized it in order to fill the smaller joints. Uh, however, we did not do the lead sealing because we saw that this created very big breathability issues. Um, before reinstalling the marble facings, uh, we conducted different non-destructive testing measurements, uh, infrared thermography. Uh, here we see a tighter range of temperature differentiations in the historic masonry. This was a very good indication of uh, compatibility. Uh, we also saw that the repointed historic masonry and the restoration masonry had similar values. And this was also, they had a homogeneous temperature distribution. So this was also a good indica indication. Although we saw that rising damp persisted because of course, repointing the masonry did not change the situation of the underground where there are different channels and areas of uh, high humidity. So rising damp is still an issue. We see that the masonry responds a lot better to this rising damp. The response is improved which is important. Um, also the GPR measurements, which were conducted after the marble facings and the restoration work was finished. So that a, there was a lack of voids and, crack, and cracks. This means that structural homogeneity had been conceived and co 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 cohesion between layers was improved. Uh, so thus we could assess, uh, assess the application of the restoration mortars because in many cases we do the whole study but then the project happens somewhere else and we do not have the opportunity to assess it, to assess the materials that we applied. But in this case, we were able to assess the materials and thankfully they worked well. Um, thus, to conclude, uh, through a multi-layered study of a monument, where of course the historic mortar is the basis, uh, we can, uh, different restoration mortar criteria can arise uh, these give us guidelines in order to select raw materials for the restoration water and also um, investigate appropriate synthesis and parameters. Uh, also, the study of the, histo of the monument uh, gives us a range of acceptable limits. It allows us to define the value, target values so we know what we want. And this is very important in order for the mortar to be compatible and performing. And of course, this is unique for each monument because by doing this study, each monument has different needs according to the uh, diagnosis stage and the results. Uh, thus, we can see here the different uh, more general criteria that can give us, can feed the restoration mortar design. These criteria all arise from the diagnosis stage. And here we can see the different criteria that arise from the diagnosis stage and how they help us assess the restoration mortars and select the best one, the most compatible and performing one. Um, so in order to conclude, conclude uh, the specific characteristics of each monument are the basis for the design of compatible restoration mortars. Uh, there is no secret, there is no recipe that can work for all monuments. We can interlink, interlink diagnosis and design of new materials by determining compatibility and performance criteria and by defining acceptable limits regarding their characteristics. 
So this is very important because it helps us in our design work. Uh, and if this is accomplished, the most compatible and performing mortar can be selected and used uh, for the restoration work. Uh, I thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, of course, uh, you can ask us. We we'll have different pictures from the project. And of course, uh, I have a lot of references in this work and related publications because everything that we said here uh, was the result of a lot of work, as you can see here, and many different people contributed to this study. Thank you very much, Dr. Apostolopoulou, uh, for uh, the very brief uh, and extended <laughs> at the same time presentation. <laughs> very good. Uh, are there any questions? We have some time. I, I think it was, it was thorough. <laughs> very much enjoy the photos. So, <laughs> if there is no question, uh, the today's uh, uh, seminar uh, uh, has been accomplished. I thank you all who lectured and who attended. And we will see you on Monday, Monday at 8 o'clock. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you everyone that well, they listen to us with patience. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye everybody. Uh, have a good continuation. <laughs>